We have spoken earlier about treasuries which are government securities issued by the central government of a country. Now in many countries, especially the United States, the state governments and local governments also issue fixed income securities and these securities that are issued by the state government or the local government are often called municipal bonds or munis. An important characteristic of munis is that the interest payments are tax exempt. And note that it's the interest payments that are tax exempt, which means that if you have any capital gain, taxes need to be paid on capital gains. Unlike securities issued by the central government of the United States, the securities that we are talking about here, uh, municipal bonds, do have some credit risk. So as an investor, when you invest in a muni, you need to evaluate the credit risk. How this process happens is discussed in level two. At this stage, all you need to know is that municipal bonds do have some credit risk. Broadly speaking, there are two types of municipal bonds, tax-backed and revenue bonds. Tax-backed bonds, as the name implies, are backed by the taxation ability of the state government or the local government. And here again, there are several subcategories. I think the most important point is to understand that, understand the distinction between tax-backed and revenue bonds. But just to be diligent, I think it's useful to also know a couple of lines about each one of these subcategories under the tax-backed bonds. So one category within tax-backed is general obligation. So this essentially means that the state government or the, or the local government has issued a bond and that local government has the authority to impose taxes and use the money collected through taxation to pay off the bond investor. Now there can be two scenarios here. One scenario is called uh, unlimited tax GO. So unlimited would mean that the that the government authority here has the ability to impose as many taxes as they want in order to meet the obligation. And the other category is a uh, limited GO which means or a limited tax GO which means that the ability of the government to issue taxes is limited so there is a certain limit up to which the government can tax and after that it's not allowed to tax obviously very simplistically put the from an investor perspective the bond which has a unlimited uh, tax general obligation has less risk Another type of tax-backed bond is a moral obligation bond. Here, a uh, issuer issues a bond and the state government or the local government is not legally bound to help make payments, but there is a moral obligation. So the point is that if necessary, there is an expectation or a moral expectation or a moral obligation that the local government or the state government will make the payments. And finally, we also have public credit enhanced bonds. And these are simply bonds which are supported by public credit enhancement programs. And essentially, they imply a, a guarantee by state governments which is legally enforceable. So there is more detail, but I think as long as you just know the basics, you are fine from an exam perspective. Revenue ben bonds to a large extent are like corporate bonds. And the idea is this. Let's say that your state government is building a highway from, let's say, Lahore to Islamabad. And, and the money that is raised or the bonds that are raised for this project are called revenue bonds because the idea being that the revenue that is gained through toll taxes and other taxes uh, 
uh, actually we should we should call it simply the tolls that people pay when they travel so that in essence in essence is the revenue generated from the project and the revenue generated from the project is then used to pay off the bond investors now we'll talk about corporate debt securities so first some general points about corporate debt and then we'll get into the different categories of corporate debt essentially when you as an investor buy uh, or invest in corporate debt you as a holder of the debt instrument have priority over equity holders if there are any sorts of bankruptcy proceedings so that is why we say that debt securities are less risky than equity securities in the context of corporate debt it's extremely important to understand this concept of credit rating whenever you invest in any corporate debt security there will be some credit risk and to understand how much credit risk there is you need to look at the credit rating and this has been implied earlier but just to make it explicit there are agencies like S&P and Moody's which issue credit ratings these credit ratings are both at a company level as well as for a particular debt obligation of a company so for example general electric as a company will probably have a credit rating from entities such as S&P and Moody's and then the specific debt obligations issued by general electric will also have a credit rating and clearly debt that is more senior or that needs to be paid off first will have a better rating than debt which is subordinate you also need to understand at a high level what are the characteristics or what is it that these rating agencies look at when they assign credit ratings to companies or to particular debt obligations this material again is covered in detail in level 2 but at a high level you should understand the four c's of credit rating the four c's are character capacity collateral and covenants so character essentially refers to the character or the quality of the management so if the management team is strong has a good reputation has a clear strategic vision has the ability to act on that on that vision then then the company will score well on this characteristic next is the capacity to pay this is usually the most important so here these entities look at various ratios such as liquidity ratios solvency ratios interest coverage ratios and essentially evaluate the capacity or the ability of the company to make the promised payments collateral deals with what sort of collateral do we have against that bond so if the quality of collateral is good then obviously that helps improve the rating covenants refers to the affirmative and negative covenants that we've spoken about earlier and obviously if the covenants are strong and investor friendly then then that helps the rating of the bond so as i said this is covered in detail in level 2 as long as you just understand one or two lines on each item that is good enough for now now in terms of specific types of debt securities you need to understand the three major categories which are corporate bonds medium term notes and commercial paper let's first cover corporate bonds so since this is probably the largest market so corporate bonds are basically the the bonds issued by the corporation and here you need to understand some of the important terms used in the context of corporate bonds uh, one is this term secured bonds so essentially with a secured bond there is some sort of collateral which is why these bonds are called secured bonds and the terminology you should know is that the bond issuer grants the bond holder a lien against pledged assets and what this lien means is that if you are the bond holder or the investor and for some reason the issuer does not make payments then you have because of this lien you have the legal right 
to sell the pledged assets or the collateral and obviously take that money so secured bonds in essence give a comfort factor or a safety factor to the bond holder then we can also have what's called unsecured bonds or debentures so these are clearly more risky than secured bonds because we don't have specific assets that are pledged however this does not mean that nothing is pledged what it what it simply means is that the the bond is not secured by specific assets however the bond holders or the investors do have a general right over assets that have not been secured against other loans so if a company has let's say 10 assets and these three assets are secured against other loans but then the remaining assets from 4 to 10 have not been secured against other loans then if there are any liquid uh, if there is uh, any bankruptcy proceedings then the the investors or the bond holders do have a right against these other assets of the company when we talk about subordinated debentures this means that these are bonds that are subordinate to some other senior debt which means that payments would first be made to the holders of these senior debt securities and once payments are made on the senior debt only then are payments made to the investors or the holders of uh subordinated debentures so that means that the riskiness here is relatively high so the return demanded by the investors of on on subordinate subordinated debentures so the return here would be higher than the return over here on senior debt and finally you should understand the concept of credit enhanced bonds this simply means that a company has issued a bond and then in order to improve the rating of this bond the company has either has received some sort of a guarantee from uh, another company and that guarantee can be in the form of a letter of credit from a bank or it could be in the form of insurance from a insurance company and so on but from a investor perspective this can create some some additional work why because let's say that this this bond is guaranteed by another entity so as an investor you also need to worry about the credit worthiness of this this entity which is called the guarantor or the entity that has provided the guarantee so if the credit worthiness here is weak then clearly that does not really help so at this point you simply need to know that uh, if if an entity has provided a guarantee then the analysis also needs to include the credit worthiness of the guarantor medium term notes and commercial paper so this is the second category actually medium term notes is the second category commercial paper is the third category so unlike the corporate bonds which i just talked about so those corporate bonds are typically sold at one time but medium term notes are not necessarily sold at one time so if you have say 5 million dollars worth of medium term notes you might have 2 million sold initially and the rest can be kept and sold later so this process is called shelf registration in the sense that the analogy being that some medium term notes are kept on the shelf and and issued or sold later medium term notes are so based on on what i'm just saying you can think of them as being continuously offered by an agent so so the medium term notes are often not directly offered by the issuer or the company itself but the company or the issuer will go through an agent and the agent uh, over time will be offering these medium term notes to investors another important characteristic of medium term notes is that the specific characteristics characteristics of the debt instrument can be customized by buyers and obviously this is a characteristic that buyers appreciate so the the type of par value the coupon payments the structure of the coupon payments whether there is any derivative instrument involved 
all this material can be customized along with the buyer of the security and obviously the agent and the issuer and the buyer all work together to figure out what works best for the buyer and then what's the appropriate price and yield and so on medium term notes can have a, a maturity period from as little as nine months to as long as 30 plus years and this clearly means that the term medium term notes is a bit of a misnomer because the duration or maturity of medium term notes can be from very short term to medium term to very long term as implied earlier the medium term notes can be fixed rate floating rate or structured there is some detail in the curriculum on different kind kinds of structured notes but I think it is good enough to just understand some basic or at least just know the terms. So what do we mean by structured notes? We simply mean that uh, we can have what's called step up notes. We can have inverse floaters that we talked about in a previous lecture where inverse floater means that if the benchmark rate goes up, the coupon rate goes down. You can have deleveraged floaters. You don't need to know what this means. Just you need to know that there are a whole bunch of structured notes that can be created. And finally, we have commercial paper. Very loosely speaking, commercial paper is the corporate equivalent of short term T bills. So the maturity would be typically from two days to 270 days. These are typically pure discount instruments. As an investor, you need to recognize that these are not very liquid. And finally, you need to know that commercial paper can be sold either through dealers, in which case this is called dealer placed, or by the company itself, in which case this is called directly placed. We can also have debt securities issued by banks and here we'll talk about negotiable CDs as well as bank acceptances. First, for those who don't know what a CD is, CD stands for a certificate of deposit and this is where a investor puts a fixed amount of money in a bank, say a thousand dollars, and the bank says that if you keep this for a certain period of time, say five years, then you will get a rate, a given interest rate of eight percent. And then if the investor withdraws the money faster than uh, earlier, then there is some fee. So essentially, the bank is giving a certain premium rate if a investor or a depositor locks in money for a certain period of time. A negotiable CD simply takes this concept and allows the CD to be sold in the secondary market or the open market prior to maturity. So the concept is straightforward. So this essentially, so the distinction between a regular CD and a negotiable CD is that the negotiable CD can be sold in the open market prior to maturity. As a, as a, as a piece of general knowledge now, large banks in London issue dollar denominated CDs and uh, these dollar denominated CDs pay a rate called the London interbank offer rate. So when you hear the term three month LIBOR, what that essentially means is if you lock your money in for a three month period, then the rate that you will get on an annualized basis is called the three month LIBOR. Bankers acceptances. Now there is a long explanation in the curriculum on what exactly is a banker's acceptance. And I really don't think you need to get into those details. Just need to know a few basic points which I have outlined here. So basically, and I'm quoting here from the curriculum, I'm quoting the two most imp the two statements that I think are most important. One statement is that uh, bankers' acceptances are essentially vehicles created to facilitate commercial trade transactions. And essentially, this is called a banker's acceptance because ultimately a bank accepts responsibility to pay the loan. I'll just explain this very briefly. As I mentioned here, these are normally involved in commercial, especially international trade. So if you have a certain exporter and a certain importer, so the idea being this, 
the importer is importing goods so goods are uh, goods are moving from the exporter to the importer and the importer needs to make a payment so the point being that this payment might be made well after the goods are shipped so the guarantee that the importer's bank makes is essentially called the banker's acceptance so that guarantee is the instrument that we are talking about here and that guarantee sometimes can itself be sold as a investment it is typically sold as a pure discount instrument as you can imagine that it's not very liquid so there are not very many dealers there is credit risk involved and as i mentioned since it's not very liquid there is liquidity risk involved also a lot more detail to this but i think at our level knowing the basics is sufficient primary and secondary markets the overall concept is similar to what you saw in our discussion on equity so what is the core distinction between a primary market and a secondary market in a primary market the issuer gets the cash so an issuer issues a bond in the primary market and then the proceeds of from that issue minus transaction costs go to the issuer so 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 clearly primary market implies that this is the market for newly created debt securities and within this within within primary markets there are i think three core terms that you should know the first is a firm commitment this is where the investment bank which works with the issuer essentially makes a firm commitment and and essentially says that okay for every bond that you are issuing we will pay you 99% of par so in essence the investment bank is providing the financing or is paying the issuer for the for the security in a best effort basis the investment bank is trying to find investors uh, for the issue so the investment bank does not make a commitment or a promise in terms of how much they will pay for the issue but the investment bank simply says that we will do our best to find investors and we will do our best to get you mr issuer the best possible price the third item you need to know here is private placement and this is where uh, where the where the issuer essentially sells or issues the bonds or the securities to private investors so typically this would these would be institutional investors who who get the bonds and this is under rule this is called a rule 144a offering the secondary market now is the market where bonds are bought and sold between investors slash dealers and the critical point here is that when bonds are bought and sold in the secondary market the money does not flow to the issuer so some general points bonds typically trade in what's called the over the counter market so you have uh, bond dealers sitting at large banks large financial institutions so these bond dealers are buying and selling the bonds so this market is called the over the counter market we don't typically have a exchange like the new york stock exchange where bonds are bought and sold bonds are primarily bought and sold in the over the counter dealer market you should also know that uh, there are two major electronic trading systems for for bonds one is called the dealer to customer or there are two categories one category is the dealer to customer systems and the other category is exchange systems at this stage you don't really need to know the details so if the issuer does not get any money from transactions that happen in the secondary market what's the benefit to the issuer and the benefit is that the issuer can obtain information about bond value and and obtain information about implied yield so if the issuer wants to issue a new bond then the secondary market helps the issuer figure out what price what yield etc and obviously if we have a active secondary market 
for the bonds of a given issuer that makes it much easier for the issue issuer to issue new bonds in the primary market and and from an investor perspective obviously if there's a secondary market investors get liquidity which obviously investors like so that is it with this rather long reading a lot of material but as always uh, please practice hard i have actually just summarized a number of points and the reason is i think it's impossible to learn all the material in this reading so as long as you know the core points and then you practice a lot you'll be in good shape if during practice you come across material you've not seen before don't worry too much because uh, it is as i said impossible to learn or know the entire material in this reading so during practice if you do a curriculum question or a or a mock exam question where you see something you've not seen before just memorize the learnings from that question and move on and again please uh, click on the like button if you liked these videos and also post your comments on youtube